Guys, have a seat. Let's chat. I know this is Google because we're mic'd. Right? Right. You're mic'd, all this tech is here, the cameras are all set up. It's, you know, a googly place. So, um, first of all, welcome to Google Chicago. We are so excited to have you guys here. This movie is incredible. Um, I guess I really shouldn't be saying welcome to Chicago for you because you are kind of a Chicago guy, right? Yep, I lived here 11 years. Incredible. Yep. And you loved it here. I mean, obviously, You've done some amazing work around Chicago stories, right? Yep. Soul food, barbershop. Yep, yep. row bounce. Right? We did, I did about, at least about six, seven movies here. Actually, wow. one thing I'm very proud of with my business partner, Bob Title, when uh, Obama was here, um, you know, he actually greenlit the, the tax incentive for film. So we were one of the first major guys to allow you know, movies to come to Chicago with a nice discount for a filmmaker. So I was really proud of that. How wild is yeah, that? Yeah. That's just incredible to me. And so one of the things that I see as a consistent theme through some of your films is the fact that you have a penchant for telling stories about the culture. Mm -hmm. All sides of the culture, right? You know, mm -hmm. you get your sadness, you get your happiness, you get the joy, and that's a lot of what we get in the hate you give. So, yeah. tell me what about this book and this screenplay drew you to it? Why did you want to tell this story specifically? Yeah, what I really love about it was it was specifically about the culture, about this young girl and her family. You know, the idea of navigating between the two worlds. So the idea of her struggling and then that being compromised when she witnessed the shooting of her best friend. I just thought that was an interesting character arc. But what I love is how the family is always centered. And no matter how tough things get, no matter how you know, people in the neighborhood telling her not to say anything about the shooting or how much pressure she feels from the police department mm -hmm. and how much pressure she feels from her white friends at her white private school, she just pushes and it makes the film have this emotional roller coaster where you're going through all these emotions. That's what I really imagine and vision for the movie when I talked to Angie because her book was very amazing. But what I really love is how, which I find really significant is that you can tell a movie about this specific culture, but it could be for everyone. Absolutely. And you can do it with a way where you're not compromising who we are. And I think Absolutely. that's the key. Absolutely. And that's one of the things that was the most beautiful about it. I mean, it's the kind of movie that can speak to a range of audiences and really welcomes them in with open arms, which is so incredible and, and hard to do, I think. Mm -hmm. So, Amanda, for you, what brought you to this movie? So I hear that you signed on even before the book was published. You were all in, ready to go, <laughs> this was for you. How did you make that decision? What connected you to Star's story? Um, what connected me to the story was the book by Angie Thomas. And if you haven't read it, I highly recommend that you do, because it is so beautiful. Second that. Um, it, yeah, I was immediately just blown away by the story and the power that it had in depicting um, a nuanced um, experience of blackness in a right. contemporary world. I feel like not often are we afforded those sorts of representations. And so it was really exhilarating to me to see this girl who was code switching, you know, um, who was presenting herself differently in different spaces. Right. Um, and then the way in which she's galvanized towards activism because of these really tragic events that we've often become desensitized, desensitized to. So to yeah. see those placed in a personal narrative and to understand the power of you know instilling empathy in people through that, that's what really drew me to it. And so you mentioned code switching. Um, and that's a term that's kind of gaining more and more attention as people are trying to understand what it is to be a person of color in two different spaces in the world, a white right. space and a black space. Can you explain a little bit more about that and how Star sees herself code switching in the movie, the specific situations that she feels that she needs to make that change? Yeah, sure. So um, code switching is, you know, entering spaces that you know you're not necessarily fully accepted into. And so understanding that the way that you present yourself in that space might be a little different from how you are in your most authentic environment because you understand that 
if you present as authentically um, as you are, it could be detrimental to your success, unfortunately, or you could be further alienated or isolated, um, which is something that everyone does, you know, when they're at home, probably a little different than who you are at work or right. at school. Um, but STAR is really caught in this dichotomy, which I actually experience as well, um, of growing up in a neighborhood that is black um, right. and has a lot less privilege than the neighborhood that the kids at her school are from because she goes to the school an hour and a half across town right. um, that's mostly white. And so she's one of the only black students there. And she does a lot of self-policing because she knows that these kids don't understand her experience of blackness, don't understand her community or who she is or her culture. And so she figures out how to adjust to that environment in order to be more accepted. Absolutely. Um, and so the way that that manifests in the film is she has star version one and star version two. Mm. And, she, and when I first read it in the book, it, it really just, it registered in a way like I'd never seen it depicted like in any sort of piece of media before. Um, where, where Star describes the experience of feeling and hearing your voice change um, right. when you enter a space that you're not most comfortable in, uh, or at least when you enter a white space in which you understand that your blackness will not be understood. Right, right. Um, so I've really connected to that and this whole idea of Star being, you know, kind of canonized by her peers at school as uh, an accessible black girl, as a non-threatening black girl, as a not like other black people black no girl. Star, you're different. You're, you're different, like you're not like mm -hmm. them. Um, which is just so kind of invalidating and simplifies our existence in a way that's really detrimental. So it was so exhilarating to me to see a portrayal of a black girl that was actually reflective of our experiences and that was really expansive and all-encompassing and multifaceted because oftentimes, you know, we're we're only given a certain amount of tropes that we're allowed to play mm -hmm. on the screen. It's a little box sometimes. It's a little box. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we can play uh, the humor, we can play the pain, yeah. but not often is it that we get to be everything. And so that's what was so exhilarating about reading this character. Um, you're right, in the unpublished manuscript. It wasn't yeah. even out yet, yeah. um, but it was, it was floating around because people were so excited about right. it. Uh, and I attached really early on. Your heart latched on, for sure. My, yeah. my heart <laughs> Which latched is great. on. That says for something about life. the work, for sure. Yeah. Um, another thing that I kind of want to discuss, I mean, I, it's super, super timely. Obviously, police brutality is on the top of mind for so many people, and especially here in Chicago, with the case of Laquan McDonald, Jason Van Dyke just being convicted for his murder. Um, what is the importance of a movie like this? Landing at this time, you know, there's never a right time to, to talk about the hard things, but it seems like this is almost healing in a way for this movie to happen right now as some things are changing in America. Mm -hmm. How do you yeah, feel about that? Yeah, I just felt like, um, you know, it was just that we were just in, I was just telling Amanda, like we were in Atlanta last week and, um, and we finished the screening and someone tapped me on my shoulder and, and I turned around and asked, can we take a picture? And I was like, yeah, we can take a picture. And they're like, thank you so much for the movie. And they said, we are the family of Emmett Till. And, wow. and I was like, you know, just kind of blown me away. It was the a whole family, like six of them. And I just think back to, you know, Emmett Till being here from Chicago, mm -hmm. going down to Mississippi, you know, he had sort of the talk early because his mom was telling him how to act down in Mississippi right. and how to conduct yourself. It's a little different from down there. So that talk is something that you progress over the years. It probably started through slavery, mm -hmm. you know, when, when we were free and how do you act around certain people. So I just felt like it was very important for other cultures to be able to recognize and see that. You know, the talk to some people is like the birds and the bees, mm -hmm. but for us, or African Americans or people of color, it's, it's a difference. So, um, and a young girl like Star just have to navigate and keep pushing through. She's very much of the world and know how to interact and know how to move inside her Garden Heights world, 
but she has another, we have these other things on this as well. So a lot of that is just to let people, as Angie would say, who wrote the book, is to have empathy, what people go through, and also recognizing how do these things happen. And in the shooting of the cop, why did he react the way he react? We talk mm -hmm. about that. And we see it from a black cop perspective with common. Yes. And we'll see sometimes it's not that much of a difference. So when you think about that, it has to be the system. Right. The system, well, how do they teach cops? What are they, who are in charge? Who are the leaders inside those departments? And we don't condemn, we, don't, we just show what the reality is right. so we can cause conversation. I thought Common's character, Uncle Carlos, was so unique, like you were saying. You don't often get the perspective of a black cop. I mean, it's such an interesting situation to be in where, you know, you see what the people are going through, you understand, you're part of the culture, and then also being kind of on the other side of these are your coworkers, these are your colleagues, and how do you speak up? So yeah. he's, he's so nuanced in that way. Yeah, and it's, it is true. I mean, us, let's say all of us in this room, we all have it inside of us. I mean. Let's just take Common's character, myself, like as an African-American man. And it's a conversation that we have had in rehearsals. If I'm walking on the south side of Chicago, if I'm by myself as an African-American man, and if I see three African-American guys walking on the other side of the street and they walk over here, mm -hmm. I'm going to think something's up. Right. I'm going to move over across the street. So that's that own internal racism that I have within myself, within my own culture. So that has to be broken. That's what Common realizes when this young girl star confronts him. Mm -hmm. And those are the kind of dialogues that the movie brings up, right. you know what I mean, on both sides. And it's beautifully done. I think Angie's you know, intention with, with the book was to like present these topics and these issues in a way that was, yeah, com that in was inclusive of different perspectives, um, that didn't further perpetuate a divisiveness, right. you know, that grounded it in humanity. And like we always get asked, about the timeliness of this project. Yeah. But the thing is, it's been timely for a really long time. Always timely. And unfortunately, it will probably be timely for a while. Mm -hmm. um, but we always get asked this also really interesting question, or I think last night we got asked it, which was, um, what is the role of an artist in social movements? Like, what is the mm -hmm. role of the filmmaker? Right. Um, you know, when is it time to make art, and then when is it time to get up and, and go out in the streets and protest. And um, I think they're so interconnected and both are so, are so invaluable. They work and, off of each other. Yeah, and they work off of each other as, you know, like art has always been one of the driving forces or conduits for social movements. And Absolutely. Like they, you know, have like a really beautiful symbiotic relationship. And so I think that was, you know, the driving force behind this piece is, to make something that in the midst of what feels like chaos and what feels like times in which things are postulated as so black and white, right. wrong versus right, mm -hmm. me versus you, um, winner versus loser, uh, I think it, was, it felt important to create something that explored it in a way that would ground us and what makes us most human and right. understand that every single experience is, is multifaceted and Mm -hmm. it, you, it requires a, in order for there to be any sort of movement made or any progress made, you, you have to consider even your enemy in a way that is not one dimensional. Right, you know? and it also comes down to empathy, like you were saying and before, empathy. just being, um, being able to understand and look at another side or perspective. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the humanity in this. You know, there's so much going on in this movie. There are so many themes, but one of the things that I found really interesting is your portrayal of the black family, right? Um, you don't get a lot of that in TV. I mean, we're we're starting to get there a little bit more with shows like Blackish, and we're normalizing it. Um, but Maverick is such an interesting character mm -hmm. as well because he is this father who is so complex, and you know, he's done time, and it wasn't necessarily his fault, but he's coming from this one life that he had before and it's kind of completely switching into a new role and he's being a father. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested to know what was the most important thing to you when you were portraying black masculinity and fatherhood mm -hmm. and, and the home in this movie. Yeah, one of the things that, um, that I love that, you know, the perspective of having a father in, the, in a movie like this, because 
you know, when I look back, I've been making films for a, for a little bit since the 90s. A little right? bit. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit. So when you look back at it, I say some of the African-American um, characters, that films that have African-American characters in it, 80, 70 percent of them don't have a father figure in the household. Right. It's always a single parent. And that's not the case in the neighborhood that I grew up in. Mm -hmm. I had fathers next to me, to the left or right of me. It was a community. The community actually raised everyone. And there was always a barbershop, like Mr. Lewis, and always a barbecue yeah. joint. And like Mr. Rubin, you know, like, I don't know if, you know, you noticed on the wall, it was like he would give the kids free barbecue if they, he sees their report cards. Yeah. And that's the kind of re, that's the kind of thing that we wanted to bring community back. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the main thing is um, I love their relationship, it was very strong in the book between yes. Mab and his daughter. And I thought that was great. And one of the things I love to say is that the family has so much joy in it. it we had so many levels of humor. Sure. Believe it or not, there's a lot of humor in a movie. Yeah, <laughs> there really is, don't get us wrong. <laughs> There'll be a lot of emotion and it's fun. You will be entertained, but it's just we're issues that we see every day. And um, I really do believe that film is an entertaining venue. That's why people pay to go see movies to be entertained. But the movie has that, but you'll be able to relate to it because there's the family and no matter all these obstacles, they keep pushing through. They keep going through and at the end we see Star has her journey and that's the main thing that I'm really proud of that it was two parents. They're very close. Yeah. They, they talk about sex other. a lot. Yeah. <laughs> the there really is like a romantic relationship that yeah. like grounds them. Yeah, really it grounds them together. Like, and I just had some <laughs> memories. I just had memories when I was we were doing a scene in the diner. Yeah. And how the family after this big incident, the family just holds their hands together and they pray. So to me that was a throwback to soul food around mm -hmm. the dinner table and mm -hmm. the yes. food and every and I'd even tell the actors to do it. Everybody just started overlapping, talking dialogue, talking about food, eat that hot sauce, don't put the hot sauce in there, you better get to those vegetables first. All that was just, we were a family at the time. Yeah, yeah. and that's what makes for really authentic storytelling too. Um, and you, you mentioned the, the fun <laughs> and the joy and the humor and, and a lot of the things you were shooting. How did you guys maintain a sense of joy? You know, I feel like black joy and black excellence, black happiness is so important in terms of self-care. So like even when you're shooting a scene that is so heavy, that's emotionally charged, how do you guys kind of come back and, and find the joy in what you're doing? Well, we have Regina Hall on set. So. Right. She is oh, a gem. <laughs> she is a gem. Oh, goodness. Um, man, she's hilarious. She always brought the joy, always brought the humor. Um, I think it's just kind of our natural inclination to work through trauma that way, to rely upon our humor and our joy and even though this experience was so intense and traumatic at times, right. there was always a sense of levity and like always a sense of community and family. Um, and a feeling that if you really were coming up against a, a wall emotionally and, and you were tired and you know, these events and portraying them feel so heavy, right. there's always someone you could turn to who would have your back. So I think it's community at its very finest. Mm -hmm. and kind of having yeah. a nice family to shoot mm -hmm. with really mm -hmm. helps with that kind of yep. thing. Yep. Yeah. Um, talking a little bit more about you know having that community and that family all around you on set. Um, in the movie, I guess Star is trying to figure out who her community is, even outside of her home. So right. in the in her school at Williamson, Chris is a great character. He's mm -hmm. really interesting because he's navigating allyship. Mm -hmm. and trying to figure out what that means for him, how he fits into the scene, how he fits into Star's life. Mm -hmm. um, if you guys had to, I guess, determine something that's important for someone who is trying to become an ally or trying to figure out how they can get involved in movements and, and civil rights and racial equality, what's the first step? You know, it, it can feel heavy, right, to, to step into a world you're not used to and be like, you know what, I'm with them. <laughs> how do you do that? Um, one of my favorite lines when I when I read it in the script, it gave it, I had this feeling of like retribution of like oh my god I wish I had, <laughs> had this in high school it would have saved me so much like internal strife, um, but there's this scene where Chris says to Star, I don't see color I just see a person for who they are like I yes. see you yes and Star says if you don't see my blackness you don't see me amen uh, and that was so validating to read on the page because I think there's this idea that in order to be an ally, you have to 
look at the other person as your equal, but almost as if in the process of doing that, in order to do that, you have to discredit the aspects of them that are different right. or that make them more marginalized than you. Right. Um, when really it, it should be the opposite. It, when you look at someone and you want to be an ally to them, it's so important that you are inclusive of all the aspects of their identity that make them them and see right. them and the way in which you know, those aspects of self uh, dictate or, or influence their experience. Because the idea of, you know, oh, I don't see color is like really like it's a great, great intention. Of course. For sure. Always, yeah. But it also like rests upon the, the assumption that we live in a post-racial, post-identity society. And right. we all know that that's Which not we true. we would love. <laughs> we would love that, but that's not where we're at. Certainly the case. Um, I don't even know if it's possible for us right. to be in a place that, you know, doesn't, doesn't use identity or as, as a lens through which we primarily look at each other. So I, I think of being an ally is about looking at someone and, and not being afraid of this comfort of, oh, this person is different than me. Mm -hmm. Their experience is different than me. Uh, it's not about trying to um, po postulate their experience as equal to yours, but rather like respecting it and all of its differences. Accepting, learning yeah, from. Yeah, learning about it. And I really think sometimes it's just about shutting up, sitting down, shutting up, and listening. Open those ears. <laughs> uh, yeah, because yeah, I think yeah. that's what is really, you know, when there's a group of people who have historically taken up a space and been very comfortable in that, it is very uncomfortable to no longer take up that space or or you know, control it, or kind of demand that you take up most of it. And right. so, it's difficult. what looks like discomfort um, to you know people who have historically had privilege is often just equity. Um, right. And right. that's what's really essential for Chris to understand is he needs to take a step back and not take up as much space, even in their conversations. Right. Um, Star is really assertive in, in making sure that he's listening to her and saying, you know, actually, this is my time to talk mm -hmm. and listen to me right Here's now. Here's my story. Here's my story. And so I think that's a huge part of it is stepping back and being like, oh, I'm so used to taking up all this space <laughs> right here. But actually, <laughs> let me step back. Let me draw it back in and allow this other person the, the time um, and the space, we're using the word space a lot, <laughs> the time and the space um, to express themselves yeah. and express their, their perspective. Yeah, there's like two people, I mean, there's two lines in a movie that define that, how an ally can work. You know, um, Sabrina Carpenter plays Haley. Right. And she says, who else gonna speak up for our people, girl? <laughs> and she's a white individual saying that. And then you got, Shook my core. Yeah, you got KJ Appa, who plays Chris, yeah. and his line is, being an ally, what do you want me to do? Mm -hmm. Where do you want me to, what, how can I help? Absolutely. So that shows the difference between the two, that we show mm -hmm. two different sides. Really? One is about listening instead mm -hmm. of trying to follow somebody. Mm -hmm. So. Being a part of it. Yep. So uh, one thing that's really interesting is, you know, as Star is trying to figure out whether or not she's going to use her voice and speak up, I mean, we see that happening in different ways in the world now with like hashtag activism, right? So it's incredible that we're using social media to, to say their names and to learn more about the, the stories that aren't really being told without it. Um, but then bringing that into the real world and taking another step is very different. So. How, what advice do you have for people who are yearning to speak out, who want to speak out, who want to try and do something new, but are kind of feeling that, that little bit of them that's holding them back? What's the first step to, to kind of opening yourself up to trying something like that? Hmm. Um, I really, because I really love approaching activism from a place of like artistry and Humanity and like when Angie Thomas wrote this book, she was still in college. Mm -hmm. uh, she was writing it on her lunch break. Lunch break. Short <laughs> story too. Yeah. Well, it was a short, it was a short story. story. Yeah. Right. You know, she was someone who was like socially active on the internet, but mm -hmm. wanted to find a conduit through which she could express it further, take the next step, and for her, that ended up writing a novel. Right. That, um, Incredible. Ended up being writing a novel that, that has now been New York. 
Times number one bestseller for 83 weeks. Right. You know? Unbelievable. I'm not saying that's going to happen to everyone. You know? right. <laughs> but Find your own lane. <laughs> Find your own lane. But I feel like, um, I don't know, I really believe in the power of, of expressing your activism through your artistry. And this was such a beautiful opportunity because it was this like synchronistic, like beautiful thing where everything came together and we were able to marry all of the things that we cared about. Um, Absolutely. And I feel like, um, yeah, it's about expressing yourself and th whatever conduit that may be, you know? Right. Okay, so we, I think we have some audience questions coming up for you guys. Sure. Two quick questions before we hop to that. And you guys can kind of start lining up at the mic if you have any questions you want to ask. Um, on a lighter note for both of you guys, you being uh, a Chicago guy, having lived here for so many years, what's one of your favorite places to eat in the city? You know what? I, they got one in, they have one in Atlanta, but it's, just, yeah. it's, it's not the same. But right down on Wabash, you know, right in front of Columbia College was Harold's Chicken. Always <laughs> so, good. So you should stop by when you're still in town. I think I want to stop by. Can we, yeah, my wife, can we stop by? <laughs> <laughs> it's a classic. Yep. And then for you, um, I heard that your Harry Potter fandom is real. Yes. <laughs> like, my heart is just skipping a beat. It's wonderful. <laughs> so I want to know, nothing to do with the movie, just my own curiosity. If you had a Patronus, what would it be? Oh my god, that's so challenging. Um, take a second. I'll start with mine. It'd be a dolphin. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, that's accurate. Right? That's good, right? I would like to think that mine would be like a deer or something, but I feel like it would probably be like a mouse. <laughs> like, okay. Hey, they're cute yeah. though, and yeah. like, real fast. Like, you never know. Um, anybody with questions? Anyone who wants to ask anything? If not, I will keep on going. Don't tempt me with a good time. Do you want to step up to the mic over here? So my question is: uh, You talked about really living this dichotomy life, uh, growing up from where you are, and then having to really change that persona when you go to school. And I think about Lakeith Stanfield in Sorry to Bother You in the mm -hmm. movie and how he switched to his white voice, mm -hmm. right? Because he had to work and he had to pretty much change his environment. So I'm curious to know, how have you been able to navigate your life in your professional career where you might have to change your mannerisms a little bit and kind of juxtaposing that with your actual environment from where you are back home? How are you able to navigate through the waters and kind of live two different personalities? Um, hmm. <laughs> Challenge. Hmm. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I started going to that school when I was, you know, 10 years old. Um, so for me, for a long time, I had this idea that there was something wrong with code switching, that, that there was something wrong with me for having kind of this multifaceted, personality that shifted depending on who I was around. Um, and it kind of took me until I was a bit older to understand that there's nothing wrong with that. And that that's pretty natural considering the circumstances. Uh, I used to hate that, 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 that I had to make myself smaller um, or, or change who I was in order to feel more accepted into that environment. But learning that language of whiteness and privilege has actually been really invaluable to me when it comes to navigating Hollywood. Uh, who would have thunk it? So, tool. <laughs> so it's a tool, you know, it's a tool at the end of the day. I don't necessarily look at it anymore as having to compromise myself. I also have kind of witnessed this shift happening where we are living in a culture that is so transparently driven by black culture and by blackness that um, I'm starting to notice that even in my spaces of work within my industry, if I show up to that space authentically as myself, I seem to be more accepted than I ever have been in the past. And there seems to be this kind of push for in inclusivity um, that is new. Um, and I'm, so I feel like I have to compromise myself less and less, um, but I'm just more accepting of all the different parts of me and the way that they manifest in my mannerisms or the way I talk. Yeah. All wrapped up nicely. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for being here. Thank we you. are just 
honored to be able to talk to you about this movie. It really is such a movement right now, and we hope that it's going to be received so well by so many people and seen all across the world. And I really think it's going to start a lot of great conversations. Like I was telling you before, I, my husband and I saw it last night. We talked about it for like an hour and a half, just <laughs> chatting and chatting and chatting. And I think that's one of the really, really special things about this movie is that it allows for that conversation in such a safe and open space, mixed with humor, mixed with emotion, mixed with you know your classic family, and I mm -hmm. think that's what's really beautiful about it. So congratulations to you Thank both. You. Thank you. Um, guys, the movie is out everywhere, October 19th. Make sure you go out and see it. Also pick up Angie Thomas's book, which is based off of, it's also a brilliant read, nice and easy all the way through, and just and a really robust story. Um, and it's kind of what inspired you yep. guys to be here. Yep, right? and it's selected it theaters this weekend. <laughs> selected Amen. theaters. So you can see it tonight in Chicago, <laughs> right here. Go out. Actually, right down the street, I heard. Right. So, it looks like so. all, of you, all of you just got plans, right, tonight? Like, now you're done. <laughs> so you don't have to think about anything. Yeah. So George Tillman Jr. and Amanda Stenberg, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.